My name is Lauren. I'm a TV writer for Showbiz Cheat Sheet and a Philadelphia native. Yeah. Um, and more importantly, I grew up watching Boy Meets World. So I'm really excited about this podcast and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk with all three of you today. Thank you. Um, so Pod Meets World premiered yesterday, June 27th. And the first episode, I have to congratulate you guys because this was the most in-depth introduction to a rewatch podcast that I've ever heard. And oh, I've heard a lot cool. of rewatch podcasts because that's like the cool new thing to do yes, now. Oh, I love that feedback. That's amazing. But it was an hour and 20 minutes worth of just like good information. I was like, okay, they perfectly explain what this podcast is going to be. You did a little FAQ section, which answered, every, I had all of those questions. <laughs> um, and for anybody watching this video, go listen to the first episode because you're going to get the answers you want. Yeah. Um, but I did think of one FAQ and maybe this is just an FAQ for me because I'm a Philadelphia native. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I know there's been a lot of debate among fans about where the show was, the town in Pennsylvania, the show was actually set. Do we have an answer? Can we clarify? We just oh. talked about that. Yeah, we were just <laughs> talking about how we never knew because you know there's some episodes where, like for instance, I know there's one episode where Sean works for the mob and like it's, <laughs> right. it's, it's a very urban space. So it was like, there was docks and I was down at, you know, remember? <laughs> yeah, working as a long shore. I mean, there's like, but right. then there's most of the episodes seem to be very <laughs> suburban right yeah. so it seems like we're kind of outside of philly yeah. in some suburb but i have no idea we never nailed we, it down. we were one of the things what we kind of came up with as we were discussing it was for, especially for uh, you know when you get into like a, an older show like a friends or a seinfeld or something from the 90s that was for adults the where they were was kind of a character on the show it was always mm -hmm. about new york and new york had its own kind of character whereas when you're doing a show for younger people you want kids from all across the country to be able to turn on the tv and imagine they live wherever those people live right. so boy meets world was a very where any town usa and other than occasionally putting Corey in a phillies hat or him mm -hmm. saying or the sixers man, yeah. Right. Or the Sixers. We were never, it was never Philly centric, which when we look back on it, we all think that was kind of a missed opportunity because I think there, there was a lot of Philly stuff we could have thrown in, which yeah. could have given it another flavor, but they really wanted to keep it, especially TGIF, ABC, Disney. It's like, it's any town USA. It's it, you turn on your TV and this could be like walking out of your own home. But I'd love to hear fan theories. Well, yeah. Two, well, I've heard Pottstown. Um, that's like the biggest one that, okay. is, which is, I don't know. Well, we'll know we made it, it if they Star Trek it. If they Star Trek it, so like, <laughs> you know, when they, they a sign. And well, yeah, they always said yes. that Captain Kirk was born in Iowa, but then one town just claimed him. And there's now a, a statue there that says future birthplace of Captain James T. Kirk. Oh, okay. So okay. If there's some I'm going to get working on that. I Yeah. If well, there's I'm a town start Pennsylvania petitioning. that's like, this is now the Boy Meets World town. <laughs> yeah, we okay, will we'll, come we'll and cut the it. ribbon. <laughs> we'll take the keys to the city for the, for the Boy Meets yeah. World town. That is, that is your job now is to get us an assigned Boy Meets World town so we can come and, and we'll cut the ribbon. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to go with Ben Salem, which is where I'm from. Uh, <laughs> I know I know some people. I'm going to make some calls. Okay, but thank you. This is yeah, to your point. Yeah. Well, to your point, it did feel like any town USA. I think I just have that affinity because I'm from here and I clung to that. I was like, these sure. people who I love so much are from where I'm from. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Though. Okay, so in the first episode, I'm going to talk a lot about things that you mentioned in the first episode. Um, this is just a quick aside. Will, you mentioned a diary that you had, and I need you to procure that diary <laughs> so that we can get some of those excerpts. I will, so, definitely. I will just, get that. I'm actually going home in like a week. So okay, when I'm wonderful. back in Connecticut in a week, I will go and I will hunt it down and I will find it. I think it's in important. My horrible for... handwriting saying like, let's <laughs> do table read today. I know. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. I think it's important for the podcast. Okay, um, done. Another thing you guys talk about in the first episode is collectively, I think this is your favorite episode. And then there was Sean, yeah. uh, which I rewatched myself last night um, and remembered pretty well because it was that scream episode. Um, I used to do a horror movie podcast. So I, I was familiar with all the horror movie tropes that come up in that show. But more than that, um, I enjoyed Jennifer Love Pfefferman's little yes. guest spot. <laughs> 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 uh, but more than that, the episode is about Sean struggling with Corey and Topanga's breakup. Can you speak? I know you're going to unpack it um, in about two years from now when you get to that episode. <laughs> but can you briefly tell us why that's your guys' favorite episode? 
I mean, primarily it's because it was the one that we remember having the most fun making. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's debatable. Like, I think there are going to be other episodes that we can look at and say, well, that's an awesome episode of television. Yeah. But that this episode was like, we had the freedom to just kind of be crazy. Uh, and, you know, there's so many weird references, so many, and it was also one of the few episodes where we were all together yes. because yeah. they often separated us into you know separate casts really so it was matt matt lawrence and will, will. off on their own thing me and you know you and trina, trina were doing and, your yeah. couple thing and like all right yeah, yeah, yeah. so that was one of the few episodes you know nowadays maybe you call it a bottleneck episode we sort of brought everybody together and it was great it was so much fun for all of us just as a cast work together so i think that's why it's our favorite uh yeah i, I would say there's going to be better episodes as far as just quality episodes yeah but it was it's it's our favorite episode because of the memories of making it not because the episode yeah. itself is so yeah. spectacular. you know spectacular itself but yeah it was I a mean, fun week of work being able I figured to as much. do multiple scenes with with will who i rarely got to work with at that time and Matt Lawrence, who I never got to work no. with. And, um, you know, it was just really fun. And then all of us getting to kind of have our own, like, well, I guess mainly Trina had that awesome, she got to take the trope of the, the screamer girl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so seeing her get to have that kind of fun of like, oh no, that's my, that's my job. Yes, like, when she screams at Jennifer Love Hewitt. <laughs> yes, and seeing each other yeah. get to have fun and play, it was really fun. Yeah. yeah. It was also, yeah. I don't want to speak for him, and I'm sure he'll talk about this when he comes on the podcast. But I remember Matt telling me one time that that was the episode where he really felt like part of the ensemble. Yeah. Because he had just okay. joined. And so it was like, now we're all together. And he was like, after that week of work, it was like all of us. All of us. Yeah. yeah. We, felt, we felt like a team. Yeah. So that's cool. Okay. And like overall, it is a fun episode. It's just the ending where Sean finds out he's the one doing the killing. So. Yeah. But we all know. I we look all. forward to two years from roughly two years from now. Yeah. When you get to that episode, because this is a weekly podcast and it's going to take it some time to get through the entirety yeah. of the show. Mm -hmm. um, another thing you guys highlight in the first episode of Pod Meets World um, are child actors and how the Boy Meets World cast kind of didn't fall into that child actor stereotype. Um, can you speak a little bit about what it was working either together or on the show or what was it? that didn't allow you guys to fall into that trap? I think actually there's a, a lot of uh, child actors from our generation that didn't mm -hmm. fall into that trap. Um, and it's just because we were the last generation before the internet. <laughs> yes. And so we had the, we had the ability to make mistakes and be, um, be human without the entire world knowing within seconds because it's being broadcast everywhere. I think a lot of what we think of for, I mean, definitely the eighties had the child star, like drugs and alcohol problem. Then there was a little bit of like a pendulum swing where you didn't have that. It was pretty much, we, we were all like really clean cut kids. Well, there was an awareness. I think because of what had happened to the first generation of like TV kids, yeah. which wasn't great. Right. No. Like you had some, you had a lot of sad, tragic stories. There was an awareness for us. Like we consciously talked about it with our parents, with the, the how producers, not to follow how not to, you know, or just how to, how to, you know, stay in school, uh, have a somewhat normal life or a set of friends that have nothing to do with the industry. We all made our versions of the conscious effort to try and stay normal, you yeah. know, or some I, version. I think it also, it came from our families. We're all from close knit families, tight knit families. That makes a big difference. We all were studious. We all enjoyed studying and learning. Well, uh, for the most part, <laughs> like boys in school. Well, no, of course I, uh, you were still normal. Sure, but sure. You were good. I mean, you were a good student, though. I mean, yes, you were. You were kind of not a good student. Exactly. So that I mean that there was a combination of things. We just had a rare combination of of again, our families got along with. There was never those stage parents that was like, "I'm putting you in the industry," yeah. and you're. We didn't. None of us had. That. I also this is maybe a, like a touchy thing to bring up, but none of us were supporting our families. Our parents had jobs, or at least one parent had a job that was supporting the family, and we were working because we wanted to be working, yeah. not because we had to. And I think, um, you know, for some families, there is no way around it. If you have a child yeah. who is working, the parents can't have full-time jobs. Somebody needs to be there with the child. Somebody needs to be with another sibling. Like, I am not judging anyone who has to rely on their, their child's income in order to make the family work. But in our situation, uh, that pressure wasn't there. So that weight was off of our shoulders, and we really could be kids who got yeah. to have the benefit of a job without it being like you're a working person yeah. who has to maintain this job yeah that it's also the, 
So in the industry, there was a, there was a, a big change financially when it came to like the 80s and the 90s. If you were a kid on television in the 70s, chances are you were, it was not like, you know, if you were coming off of something like different strokes or something like that, you weren't getting residual money to where it was something where it could sustain you forever if you did two or three years on a show. Okay. So all of a sudden your career would be over and that was it, you were done. And now what do I do? I knew one thing from the time I was seven, eight years old. I'm now 15 and they're telling me that I'm washed up. Um, I have no income coming in. The, I'm getting kind of exploited for the stuff I've done in the past. And I'm really getting nothing from that. It's starting to change. It was changing with the, 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 the Coogan law, um, which was helpful, where, where a certain amount of your income was automatically put away. Look but at as you it, citing your law knowledge. Yeah. I love Sorry, it. Sorry, both my parents are lawyers. Yeah, yeah. Look at, <laughs> it, is, it's one, it, is, it is. It's one of those things where child actors, as we were coming up, were more taken care of. Uh, than they were beforehand. They were a little more protected. Yeah. And they were protected. Yeah. And that makes a very big difference where, the, you know, we, we all wanted to be there. We, we wanted to be acting. We wanted to do everything we had to do. And we were compensated fairly for it. And that wasn't always the case back in the day with child actors. So we started to really get the benefit of, of, of a lot of unfortunate stories that happened before us. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad it worked out in your guys' favor because covering the other side of the coin is not fun for me. This is a, no, this is a joy no, and a delight. <laughs> no, and that's why you'll never see me make fun of a child actor who's, who's yeah. falling by the wayside. Like you'll ne uh, because we know we there. How that I, life can be, and and right. it, it can easily happen. And when you go from having the rush of uh, of the joy of your life on one night in front of the audience and the next night you're done and literally you're 16 and they're like, that's the highlight of your life. Bye. You just lived the first line of your obituary. See ya. Um, yeah. it, it can be jarring. So yeah. there's some people that just had more trouble adapting than others did. And it's, it's really sad. It's true, but glad again, once again, glad it's not you guys. Um, shifting a little bit, um, in my opinion, one of the things about Boy Meets World um, and why it became so popular was the varying storylines. It was one of the first shows that I can remember talking about things um, juxtaposing Corey and his loving family versus Sean and his broken family. Um, they explored young relationships, um, blended families. What lessons do you want this new generation? Because there is going to be a new generation of people that are going to watch this show. Yeah, I don't, it, it happened with The Office and The Office Rewatch podcast. It's going to happen. I'm calling it now with Boy Meets <laughs> World. Um, what do you want that new generation to take away um, listening to the podcast and rewatching the show along with you guys. It's well, a, it's a hefty yeah, ask. So <laughs> I, I, I know that like to give you like the sound bitey answer. Um, I think one of the greatest takeaways from boy meets world was that you don't need to be blood to be family. And I think that's something that we have discovered throughout the course of our lives. We are not related by blood, but we are absolutely family. And, um, we always will be. And, and it, there is a nice feeling of knowing there is a bond here that literally nothing could break. And, and we have come and gone in each other's lives. Or there have been some times where we haven't spoken for a year or two, or maybe even longer. But then when we meet back up, it is as if no time has passed and that, that deep connection is still there. And I think that's a really important lesson for anyone that you don't have to just look to the people who are related to you by blood to create the group of people that you surround yourself with. And so I think if, if I had to pick one lesson, it, it might be that, that you can choose your family. It's a good one. It's a great one. And don't join a cult. Don't, join a cult. <laughs> don't blow up a mailbox. Don't blow up okay. a mailbox. Don't blow up a mailbox. <laughs> that's, that's fair. That's good. That is, that's an excellent answer. And what I thought you would say, and I can't tell you how much it delights me because again, you hear about these casts who like work together when they're young and they don't maintain those relationships, but it delights me so much that you guys are real life besties. Hey. Um, wow. Another thing you guys mentioned in the first episode is how this podcast idea came about. It was Ryder's idea, right? Ryder's idea came about in 2018. Um, what has been the most surprising thing kind of getting this off the ground for you guys? Well, for one thing, that was a mistake on my part. It was 2019. Oh, 2019. I think, yeah, I think it was yeah, the beginning okay. of 2019 that we started talking about it. So it was like, I was off by, uh, by when, a few months. Yeah, when Bill came up with the idea. Yeah, when Bill did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right? He called us. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think the most, what do you think that was the most surprising thing? Getting this off? I mean, honestly, 
it was really easy. It was. We, when we talked about it in 2019, it wasn't quite as easy because the genre of rewatch podcasts, which you've mentioned, they didn't, it didn't yeah. exist. Yeah. He right. was really like the first person to bring up the idea. Yeah, exactly. And so we were like, how do you even do that? Do you watch it at the same time? Yeah, we, we can't do that. So we were discussing all the different ways. Do we do it on YouTube? Like, where do we do it? Um, and then since then, obviously we've had some help um, with the, that whole genre of podcasts coming up. So once we made the decision that we wanted to do it, iHeart was such a natural partner and a natural fit for us. They have been so supportive. They've been amazing. And they, they really, really handed us full creative control, which was the most important thing to us. It's like, we yeah. didn't want somebody telling us, here's how you have to do your podcast. Right. And um, so I think for me, it's been surprising that it's been as easy and as, as it has been. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they've been great. They really have. Not to be this actor is like, and I really want to thank, but iHeart has been awesome. <laughs> oh, we, I mean, we love iHeart Radio. <laughs> yeah, no, they've been really phenomenal with us. So uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was pretty great. Great. You, you mentioned William Daniels. Um, what is the best advice that he has ever given you as, oh. as Bill Daniels? Get out of my dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing he ever told me, and, and I absolutely sense. stuck with it. Oh, ever please since. elaborate. We don't, we don't ever break into anybody's dressing rooms anymore. Um, I don't know. I know, I know one. Okay. I, he, he, told, uh, he told a whole crowd of people, but he used to tell us a similar thing where he said, you're an actor, actors act, take every opportunity you can to, to utilize your craft. He's like, if you're in front of your family and you have the need to act, then that's your audience and you act. And that always stuck with me, the idea where it's like, you take the stage whenever you can, however you can, and you promote your craft. And I, I, that always, that always stuck with me. It really did. I love it. I love that he really is like the real life Mr. Feeney. And I he can't is. wait for you to have him on the awesome. show. <laughs> well, you wait, you just wait. Cause it was pretty phenomenal. Thank you guys so much for your time. I can't wait to share this podcast with everybody. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Get on the Pennsylvania thing. We'll be there. Yes, I will. <laughs> All right. Thanks, thanks All right. guys. Bye-bye. Bye.